Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I believe it's time to get started, and we don't want to delay this very important program. I'm Town Voice Bay Supervisor Joseph Saladino. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for attending tonight's Long Island Sound Tunnel Public Information Meeting. On behalf of my colleagues on the town board, I'd like to welcome all of you to Jericho High School for this special community meeting that the town is co-hosting. And we have town board members here. I'd like to recognize each and every one of them, starting from our North Shore Angel. She is always watching out for all of us throughout the town, and especially the North Shore, Councilwoman Michelle Johnson. He's been on the board for a while and he's tackled tough issues and that's why having him on our team on this issue is so important. Councilman Joseph Muscarella. <laughs> then we have the two new members. The, uh, starting with the Fighting Irishman. He's, oh, you always want him in your corner. He's a good man. Councilman Tom Hand. We're also joined by a new councilman who's doing a wonderful job, Councilman Lewin Brodo. And we also have with us our receiver of taxes, James J. Stefanich. Dude, that's a good sign. Sometimes you get the boo, so it's obvious people know that your opposition to the title is very much appreciated. We have so many other people here, I'd just like to recognize a few of them. It's important to know who is standing in lockstep with you. First of all, I'd like to thank for the use of this wonderful, gorgeous facility, all of the members of the Jericho School Board. We are joined by Jericho Superintendent, Hank Grisham. Grishman. Where are you, Hank? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're joined by a, a number of elected officials who we appreciate their work on this, starting with uh, Bayville Trustee John Taylor, who's heading up our program this evening. The Mayor of Bayville, a good friend to us all, Paul Rupp. Mayor of Laurel Hollow, Dan DeVita. Another Bayville Trustee, Bob De Di Natale. I see we have Mayor Sirota with us. Mayor Sirota, Dan Sirota. Another trustee from the village of Bayville, Bob Nigro. We have a dear friend. He is an ardent fighter, a lifelong resident of Bayville, and someone who is in lockstep with us in opposing the tunnel, and that's Judge Colin O'Donnell. We're also joined by Coveneck Mayor Thomas Zola. And uh, we have a few people who set representatives, they're going to be joining us later in the evening, including the Mayor of Mill Neck, Peter Quick, and I mentioned uh, Mayor Tom Zola, uh, Mayor Larry Schmidt-Lapp will be joining us from Center Island. And a uh, big thanks to New York State Senator Carl Marcelino. Carl is represented very aptly this evening. He is in session in Albany, something I know all too well because before you were so kind enough to make me your town supervisor, I spent the last 14 years as a state assemblyman, and they, uh, June is a tough month in Albany. But to have Carl Marcelino there, standing up to the governor, the administration, and making it very clear that we are unified against such construction in our community is a big deal and having that additional pressure and leverage of, of the help of Carl Marcelino is a big deal. So thank you to Senator Carl Marcelino. We are hosting this meeting to provide you, the residents of our town, an important opportunity to learn more about the impacts of a cross sound tunnel. It is my belief, it is the belief of all of the members of the Oyster Bay Town Board who you see with us here tonight, 
that this project will have many, many negative impacts on the communities within our town, especially on the north shore of our town, but throughout the town of Oyster Bay. It poses significant risks to all of Long Island and to our state. We are very concerned about the air pollution that would be caused by a tremendous influx of traffic, especially diesel trucks, but to name but a few. It's a big problem. You know it. That's why you're here. Some people know, including Ms. Bologna, that my father was a councilman in the town of Oyster Bay back in the 1970s. And I remember as a young child, residents coming to our home with signs to make it very clear that they were opposed to the tunnel. And as a young boy, I was about the age of, of uh, Neil and Ian, who were sitting over there somewhere. Hi, boys. And I couldn't understand why all these people were at our home and what was this about. And Dad said that they don't want their communities destroyed. They don't want the problems of tremendous traffic, the potential for more crime, the impact in the Bay. And back then, people didn't fully understand our precious aquifer system that we draw all of our drinking water from on Long Island, that is so distinct from anywhere else in the nation. Well, a tunnel of this nature would have to tunnel through to the bedrock, piercing portions of the aquifer system that the Department of Environmental Conservation wouldn't let anyone pierce. Not a developer, not a water district. There are a rare few places where on Long Island where the Lloyd Aquifer is pierced because they have saltwater intrusion. I won't get into all the science. I know Dr. Bird knows the science very well. But there are places on Long Island where it's very, very rare, only because there's no other way to get drinking water. So why then would it make any sense to pierce the most precious ports of our aquifer simply for the reason of building a tunnel that would bring a tremendous amount of traffic, congestion, air pollution, potential pollution to, to, the, to, the, uh, to Oyster Bay and to the Long Island Sound, our, our pre precious marine environments. It just makes no sense. So it's our belief that it will have negative impacts throughout our communities from tunneling underneath thousands of homes to an influx of visitors flooding our beaches and roads, this project will devastate our suburban quality of life. I guess you can tell I'm not on the fence on this project. I believe that the potential contamination is too big of a risk to take. The presentation you will see this evening will, bring, will answer a lot of the questions that we have, and we appreciate your feedback. We ask those wishing to speak this evening to fill out a card located in the back of the room and submit it to the table at the front left, this table right here, so we can keep track and give everyone an opportunity to speak. Each resident has been allotted three minutes to speak, and when your time has expired, we'll notify you and kindly ask you to wrap up your remarks. But please know, just by asking you to be brief does not take away from the impact. We get it, and we're on your side. Whether you're here about this project, whether it's to support the project, oppose the project, or simply learn more about it, we are here to listen to you. I've been saying for 14 months, it's a new day in the town of Oyster Bay, and once again, this evening, we will prove it. If you're unable to stay for the entire evening, or if you'd like to just submit a statement in written form instead of coming up to speak, please do so by emailing us at publiccomment at oysterbay-ny.gov. That's public comment, one word, at oysterbay-ny.gov. That gov. And uh, if you also haven't yet, the town of Oyster Bay um, has <clears throat> an opportunity to go online to our town website where you can fill out a petition to also show your concerns 
and that you are in support with us in opposing this project. So on behalf of all of my colleagues on the town board, who I'll be walking over to join them in just a moment, we'd like to thank you for coming out this evening and for your participation. And now I'd like to turn things over for our program to the Village of Bayville trustee, John Taylor, who serves as chair of the Anti-Tuttle Committee. Thank you, John. Let's give my hand. Thank you, Supervisor Saladina. Um, and I just want to mention that we know that the town is financially challenged now, but shortening the summer season when it was 86 degrees on Saturday to 51 degrees today to save money on lifeguards was not a good idea. Uh, we really could use some of but we're not going to have any North Shore if this tunnel is built. So to start off, I think what I'd like to do is just tell you how we started um, and then go into the details of what we've learned. Um, the committee that we formed was formed by Babel's Mayor Paul Rupp. He uh, learned about this project and said we have to act proactively against it. And he asked uh, some of us trustees to... Uh, form a committee and get active and learn about it and get the information out to the public. The committee is composed of myself, uh, Deputy Mayor Joe Russo to my left, Trustee Tim Sharon, former trustee and deputy, former Deputy Mayor Rena Bologna, um, Jen Jones, uh, to her left George, uh, Jen is a resident of Bayville and an ex a, a technology executive. To her left is George Jen, who was a former trustee and was around to fight the bridge back in the 70s, so he's very familiar with the history of this. Um, we have also on the committee planning board member and uh, former head of the zoning board, Jean Poligi, um, and attorney Loretta Cummings. And then to her left, not a fatal uh, committee member, but Peter Jana, who is the head of a separate organization we're going to tell you about tonight, called the Coalition Against an Unsound Tunnel. Um, the thing you need to know is your presence here is going to make a difference. Last week, Newsday published an op-ed piece. In part, they said, so what happened? And there's talking about the multiple fights there have been about a sound crossing, whether it be a bridge or a tunnel. What happened? Here's a clue. The story that did not mention the force of nature that scuttled both sculled one North Shore Bridge proposal after another, the public. Given the hundreds of people who have been turning up to protest Andrew Como's proposed tunnel from the end of Worcester, the Seaford Worcester Bay Expressway to Westchester County, they're still at it. A half century later, the force of nature that scuttled both one North Shore Bridge proposal after another is the public. As I said before, your presence here tonight is being noticed and is making a difference. This is the third meeting. We're going to do more. We've got another one booked for Sayasset on the 14th. We're going over to Rye to talk to our friends on the other side of the Sound. We're just going to be as negatively impacted as we are. Uh, and we will do this as often as it needs to be done so that everybody understands the real issues that are at stake here. How did it start? Well, it started in January 5th at the State of the State speech that Governor Como gave. He said, we committed $5 million in state funds to a feasibility study for a new crossing of Long Island Sound. The study funding was listed among several goals for 2016 aimed at improving downstate infrastructure. Governor Nakoto Como said the study will look at three potential destination points, the Bronx, Westchester, and Connecticut. His quote was, I want to do a really thorough feasibility study. I think we can build a tunnel from Long Island to either the Bronx, Westchester, or Connecticut. We have to think bold, we have to think big, we can do it, we are New Yorkers, there's nothing we can't do. The um, supporters of the tunnel are the Long Island Association, which is a business group headed by a gentleman named Mr. Kevin Law, the construction trade unions, the transportation lobby, tunnel construction companies, construction equipment manufacturers, road construction companies, warehouse construction companies, and companies like Amazon who want to turn our farmlands into Amazon uh, distribution centers with the thousands and thousands of trucks coming in and out of them. 
It started with uh, that statement by Governor Cuomo in 2016. He commissioned a two-year study. It cost us taxpayers $5 million. Um, it was published in 2017, the end of last year. The study was created by a company called WSP. It's an international engineering firm headquartered in Montreal, Canada. The title is the Long Island Sound Crossing Feasibility Study. It runs 88 pages. It's available online at the Department, New York State Department of Transportation website, or you can just Google Long Island Sound Feasibility Study. The first to sound the alarm after that speech was, you know, not everybody watches the State of the Union, uh, the State of the State speech. You might watch the State of the Union from Washington. The State of the State speech, um, not as many people, but Senator Marcelino was watching. He was there. He immediately called a press conference. He said, he got in touch with all of us local officials and said, you guys need to know about this. This is a serious threat to your, your communities. Um, and he literally was the one to sound the alarm. He, we had a press conference on April 15th of 2016, where the senator uh, spoke forcefully with a lot of us local officials against why this proposal, even without even going into the details we're going to go into tonight, was not a good idea and that it did represent a threat. Subsequently to that, there was a lot of press coverage. Um, Newsday ran a story right in the front, said busting a bridge. After that, Supervisor Saladino on July 13th responded to a statement coming from the Federal Railroad Authority, and he held another press conference that was covered. This is a screenshot from Channel 12, um, where he basically was really pleased that the Federal Railroad Authority said they would not help fund on their own sound crossing, but he also said at that time uh, that we really have to be diligent. This was only one roadblock in the way, but it's still moving forward, and he encouraged everybody to stay alert and watch what's going on. So thanks to Sal uh, Supervisor Saladino for continuing to uh, keep us aware. What happened next is we had a meeting and after the study was published in December 2017, we convened a special meeting of all the local mayors and trustees in Senator Marcelino's yesterday office on February 8th. It, it, that meeting was represented by, May, by people from Bagel, White Harbor, Asheroka, and Laddingtown, Cove Neck, Center Island, Laurel Hollow, Mill Neck, Oyster Bay Cove, Seacliff, Rockport, Brookville, and Brookville. All the mayors, well, a lot of trustees were present at that meeting. At that meeting, we planned another press conference to keep the public aware of what's going on. Senator Marcelino spoke, a lot of the other officials spoke. It was covered by a lot of the newspapers. Um, it was held at Teddy Roosevelt Park. Channel 12 was there. Uh, Fios 1 was there from Verizon. Um, and it did get covered. Following that, we asked for a meeting with Governor Cuomo's representatives, when I say we, the Bayville Tunnel Committee. We met on Friday, March 23rd in Bayville Village Hall with uh, his representatives, which were Peter Kiernan, who is the Special Counselor for I Infrastructure Initiatives in the Governor's Executive Chamber. We also met with Lisa Santoramo, who's the Director of Operations for Long Island for the Governor, and Imran Ansari, who's the Governor's Representative for Long Island, Nassau County. They spent a lot of time with us. They were very forthright and very open. They said they had nothing to hide. This was a public matter, and, and there was nothing that wasn't going to be on the record. So they basically told us the following information that we're going to tell you now. The tunnel was initially proposed to be based on a 2001 proposal from Polinary International, which was to have a tunnel of three tubes with three lanes of traffic in each of the two tubes and a central service tube. The central service tube was also discussed to be converted into a rail link to carry freight, rail freight. Subsequently to that, because of the extreme nature of the budget for three tubes, it was downsized to a um, Current plan for a single multi-level tube with two lanes, and two lanes on each of two levels with a 58-foot diameter. A lot easier to drill 18 miles of three, one tube rather than three tubes. The first thing that came out of the feasibility study, and we had a long discussion with uh, Mr. Kiernan about this in our offices, 
was that there were three possible routes studied and the eastern routes were immediately eliminated due to the higher cost. The, the eastern routes would have gone from Island Park or Shore and Area over to Connecticut. The reason they were scuttled was not just because of cost, but because Connecticut would not get involved. Connecticut's in worse financial shape than almost any state. They're almost bankrupt. They didn't want it. They've got their own traffic problems. They didn't see this solving those problems. So the western alignment became the only feasible option. The western alignment, this is a table from the feasibility study, shows a tunnel of 18 miles of length, total nine miles under Long Island Sound, nine miles underground, and that is nine miles, a few miles in, in Westchester, from the shoreline up to 287 and 95 junction, and then, nine and then a few more miles underground from where the uh, Sound and Worcester Bay end all the way to junction 135 and Seaford Worcester Bay Expressway. So 18 miles, I don't know if you've ever driven in a tunnel that long, kind of scares me. Okay, the western alignment is in green. I'll zoom in on that. You can see the route it goes from Rye over to Oyster Bay. Greenland ends down at the end of Seaford Oyster Bay Expressway. That's where the entrance and exit would be. Okay, on the other side, it would end up uh, right where 287 meets 95. If you've ever been there, there's traffic there almost 24 hours a day. It's bumper to bumper. It's not going to relieve it. It's going to hurt those people much worse. It's going to drive more people to it. The estimated daily usage from the feasibility study, and we think this is a little wrong, and we challenged them on this, was that it would be about 86,000 vehicles per day. 4.3% would be trucks. That equals 3,700 3, trucks with their diesel exhaust. Um, it would be a $20 toll for uh, cars. Um, if, it was, uh, if you take that number down to 74,000, the low end, you might end up with uh, 30. That would be the result if you charge more than $25 toll. They said basically there's a tipping point where you charge too much, the usage goes down. So they've kind of settled in at around a $20, $25 toll. The maximum projection toll would toll drive usage down so they end up with actually less revenue in, in total. The capital cost for this project we're seeing at about $31 to $54 billion, depending on whether it's two lanes or three lanes if anything changes. Um, total is $25 bucks for cars, $75 bucks for trucks, maybe $100 bucks for trucks. They predict the tolls might generate between 520 and 556 million a year. Loretta will explain later why that doesn't even begin to pay for it. Um, we ran the numbers because we thought that was very low for the trucks because they, one of the main purposes of this tunnel was to get more trucks in and out of these warehouses. So how would it only be four or three, four percent? And who's going to pay a forty dollar round trip toll just to save it twenty minutes or half an hour? Uh, so we think it's mostly about freight, and they'd be probably a lot more truck screws in it than they projected. Uh, and if we did rerun that number with a higher truck toll, it would still be only $850 million in revenue. Um, one of the things you may not know about is that tunnels don't just go underground and disappear. Tunnels need air. Um, there's a long tunnel over in England that doesn't need air. It's called the Channel. The reason it doesn't need air is electric trains are the only vehicles who travel through the channel. They are not combustion engines. They only 400 trains a day go through those things at high speed, up to 180 miles an hour. So they're in and out very quickly. Um, and it doesn't need the kind of ventilation you need in a tunnel with 86,000 combustion engines a day. Um, what happens with these tunnels is that they need these big invention, uh, these uh, shafts. They're emergency access, they exhaust the, the fumes, they bring fresh air in. They're multi-story structures that are typically 10 miles, yeah, 10, 10 miles. <laughs> They're typically 10 stories high. They have their own generator plants because they can't rely on the grid. It doesn't produce enough electricity. And if the grid goes down, there's a blackout. They have to continue to provide fresh air to the tunnel. What do they look like? They look like this. This is the Lincoln Tunnel. 10 stories high for a 1.5 mile tunnel. These are built a long time ago. Uh, the Holland Tunnel has similar structures. Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And then the famous Big Dig in Boston, which is a much more modern structure. The Big Dig was only completed in 2007. They have 20 of these structures around Boston. 
Okay, so pretty scary looking if you think about what our landscape is like. And this is the Second Avenue subway. That's a 10 story building right in the corner of Second Avenue and 69th Street. You can tell how high it is, just count the number of windows in the apartment building adjacent to it. And that brings out the fumes. There's no fumes from that tunnel though, because that's an electric railroad, the subway. But it has to provide fresh air to everybody in it. So the plants are really, they're a combination of a power plant. The schematic for how that works is very complex engineering, giant fans. Oh, what happened here? Um, these fans are immense. They're noisy. They, the power plant itself has a lot of, you know, noise coming from it 24-7. Where would they be located? Well, there would be several possible locations. These are not from the feasibility study. We don't know for sure where they will be placed. That will be up to the engineering that's done if this project proceeds. But they could, they need to be near the shoreline because nine miles of this tunnel is under Long Island Sound. So they'd be on the rise side and they'd be somewhere on the Long Island side. They could be up in Bayville by our town of Worcester Bay, Center Island Beach, which is beautiful ball fields and beaches and parking lots that people love. That could be obliterated. It could be right in the middle of Center Island, right next to Billy Joe's house, good friend of the, of the governor. Or they could be down by Worcester Bay, by Teddy Roosevelt Park. They could be, you know, if they were in Babel, that's where they'd be. This is what they look like. That's what it looks like now, if you're on West Shore Road heading to Babel. And that's what it would look like with these towers, venting all that, those fumes. Okay, what would it look like in Sayasa? Well, Sayasa, they don't just need the these vents to have when the tunnel is open. They need it to construct the tunnel. The equipment that, make, that bores these tunnels is powered by electricity mostly. And they build a power plant at the entrance to the tunnel. And that power plant is there throughout the duration of the construction, which we're projecting could be 10 to 15 years. So right at the end of 135, this is what you see now. And this is what you'll see if the plane was built. And that would probably not go away because you know they might you got six miles from that entrance to the shoreline where there's another shaft. So maybe they'll have a few of them. They could be anywhere. They could be right in the middle of the uh, country club and if you have a event at Pine Hall. On uh, Fox Hollow, this is what you'll see, because that's the view right next to Fox Hollow. Uh, when they start boring, the effect on the local area is tremendous. Major disruptions during construction. You got in trucks, thousands of trucks, lots of noise all the time. That's that big boring machine on the bottom right that they told you is powered by a power plant. Um, they have to remove all that rock and silt and sludge and they're going to pull it right through your communities. Um, it's going to continue, they say, eight years in the feasibility study. We know from experience that these things usually take a lot longer. The unseen obstacles, once they get started, all kinds of delays. Uh, very few projects of this nature finish on time. The, can you imagine the detours that you'll have to face if you're forced during that eight to 12 year, whatever it takes, construction? Local residential roads, Northern Boulevard, Jericho Turnpike, 135, 106, 107, they'll be bumper to bumper all day. The objective of this tunnel is stated right in the feasibility study, generate auto and truck demand. Notice it says generate. It doesn't say relieve congestion. It says bring more stuff in. Demand, they, and this is a quote from the feasibility study, demand during the year 2040, morning peak would admit, equal the capacity of the tunnel. After 2040, the peak demand would be ex exceeded by the tunnel. So it wouldn't even accomplish its goals. It would be, it would take so sometime in 20, late 2020s to finish, maybe in the 2030s. And then shortly after that, it's not providing any relief from congestion. Okay, it's gonna, re we're gonna talk about this in detail more, but historically, these tunnels and bridges don't relieve traffic, they generate more. A 24 meta-analysis study took in dozens of previously published studies and it confirmed this. It says on an average, a 10% increase in lane miles induces 
an immediate 4% increase in vehicle miles travels, which climbs to 10% the entire new capacity of the new crossing in a few years. I'm going to turn it over now to George Jen, who is going to talk about the history of this. And there's nobody better suited to talk about the history because George lived it. He was part of the battle that stopped the bridge back in the 70s. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for coming this evening. I appreciate it. I guess because I was involved in uh, 1970 onward, that makes me probably the oldest member of the committee. But I'll accept it. Um, uh, a long time ago, back in uh, actually the late mid, mid to late 60s, there were various proposals to build a bridge across the Sound. They were made by uh, the master builder, Mr. Uh, Robert Moses. And uh, as we know, the uh, governor, the then governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, also uh, joined in the battle to attempt to uh, get this bridge built. And it was only through the uh, goodness of the residents in areas like Mill Neck, Center Island, uh, Bayville, and Oyster Bay Cove that the idea was, uh, Kev, was put forward to uh, change the privately owned property and make it into federal wetlands and donate it to the federal government, which is what was done. And uh, the people in Westchester were also involved in that, also doing that. Then uh, there, there were a number of people uh, who were responsible for uh, stopping it the last time around. Uh, one from uh, left to right is the late Senator Ralph Marino. Then we had uh, Senator Louis, uh, excuse me, Assemblyman Louis Yavaldi, Babel uh, Mayor Duncan Sterling, yours truly from pictures from 40 years ago. Right? Uh, uh, Babel trustee, uh, former trustee, John, late Joan Imhoff, and uh, Babel environmentalist Don Cotton. And uh, we were finally successful in doing it thanks to uh, Congressman Lester Wolf, who uh, put the, uh, the plan up that we had uh, provided him uh, to make the uh, Federal Wildlife Preserve the sanctuary. And uh, it was submitted, it was created by a bill that Congressman Wolf submitted, and he's been in our last two meetings. He's uh, 99 years young now, and he has just as much fight left in him as he did back then. And uh, anyway, the federal, uh, the federal law that was passed prohibited any new construction within, on, the border of, above, or beneath, which is very important, uh, the Federal Wildlife Preserve. In spite of this, uh, Governor Rockefeller continued to move ahead with the project. Uh, there were, that's when the Coalition Against an Unsound Bridge that I was a member of, uh, we uh, formed in Bayville. And we produced, uh, as a result of uh, Congressman Wolf's uh, law, the, the state had to produce a, uh, in, a uh, in, environmental impact statement. And our group of three, uh, that was started by, Joe, uh, by Don Cotton, Joe Nimhoff and I, and by that time grown to approximately 200 people, and we produced a counter-impact statement, which we sent out to all the newspapers, and the New York Times printed it on the first page. The, uh, that coinciding with that, the Department of Interior, they uh, filed a federal lawsuit at the time to stop the bridge from uh, being built. And uh, Governor Rockefeller, who everyone knew, I think, in New York, wanted to be president, just abruptly withdrew the plans for the bridge. And uh, a lot of people thought, well, that's it, we're protected forever now. But that's not the case, because upon the cancellation of the project, the issues that the state had raised with the federal government were never litigated. So we don't know what the outcome of that may, may or may not be. And that's basically the position that we find ourselves in today. And uh, back in 2007, uh, Mary International proposed a 16-mile-long uh, three-tube tunnel that was similar to the one that John showed. And it was expected at that time to cost $10 billion. Uh, the Wild developer, Vincent Palomari, he passed away in 2013. It would have been uh, privately funded, and uh, they expected to re re recover the cost through a, a $25 toll each way for a, a private automobile. Uh, that would have created the longest highway tunnel in uh, the world, but uh, fortunately, that was uh, maybe not fortunately, 
that was when the recession came along, and with that the uh, entire idea also died. So to, just to sum up, there have been uh, more than 10 proposals so far that have been uh, made to build a tunnel or a bridge across Long Island Sound. And I, I wouldn't personally be surprised if when uh, the governor reads about how uh, dramatically impacted, negatively impacted the uh, uh, finances from this one are, that uh, we, might, we might be looking at another bridge in the near future, but uh, that, that of course is up to him. And uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Loretta Cummings, who will uh, give you some more on the uh, financial aspects of it. Thank you. study resulted in a high estimate of $55 billion for the tunnel. Um, however, the governor's representatives have since stated that the cost would be around $31.5 billion. This is because of savings or choosing to use the Western route or the Rye to Bayville route. The savings from advances in tunnel boring technology and the decision to use a single double deck instead of three separate tubes. The financing to create this authority, how are they going to come up with this $31.5 billion? Governor Cuomo intends to create a new independent tunnel authority similar to the Port Authority, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and the New York State Thruway Authority. A tunnel authority would have the power to issue bonds. However, it will not be under the control of the Department of Transportation, and it will not be accountable to the public. The creation of a new authority requires authorization of the New York State Legislature. When the authority issues bonds, they circumvent the need to get funding from the New York State Legislature and therefore circumvent our vote, our voice in the tunnel process. The tunnel authority would issue state tax-free bonds. Again, this circumvents the need to get funding from the New York State Legislature. The authority would look to bond investors, namely state employee pension funds, union pension funds, foreign banks and governments, notably China, industries who benefit from construction and equipment contracts to build the tunnel, and private and public funds. The annual debt cost would be $1.5 billion on a $31.5 billion tunnel and $2.5 billion on a $55 million billion ton. This does not pay down any of the construction costs. It only covers the debt. It does not account either for annual operations or maintenance. So where is the revenue to pay this? The ant anticipated annual toll revenue would be between $520 to $850 million. This is based on a maximum toll of between $20 to $25 for cars each way and trucks up to $75 each way. Higher tolls, they believe, would result in significantly less usage of the tunnel. This structure would, this tunnel toll structure would result in an anticipated annual shortfall of $1.5 billion for a $31.5 billion cost with a $20 toll a $650 million short cost for a $31.5 billion, uh, a $650 million cost for a $31.5 billion tunnel with a $25 toll, a $2 billion cost for a $55 billion tunnel with a $20 toll, and a $6.15 billion cost for a $55 billion tunnel with a $25 toll. Again, these numbers do not anticipate annual operation and maintenance in the tens of millions of dollars. This shortfall in revenue would ultimately become the responsibility of all New York State taxpayers, all, for, all over from Buffalo out to Montauk, whether they use this tunnel or not. This is all based on the capital cost estimates as described in the feasibility study and reiterated by the governor's staff. Cost overruns are a historical reality for government projects. For example, the Fulton Street Transit Hub. 
Original estimate, $750 million to complete, seven years to do the work. The final cost, $1.4 billion with 12 years to complete. The east side access, the LIRR station beneath Grand Central. Crane's businesses run bond throat, that was another billion dollars down the tube because the original estimate of $3.5 billion, $3.5 billion with a scheduled completion date of 2006 has now escalated to an $11.2 billion cost, which is three times the estimated cost, and an updated completion date of 2023, which is more than a decade past its original deadline. Initially, this project was projected to cost $2.2 billion when Alphonse D'Amato then Senator first championed the initiative in the 1990s. Then we had Boston's Big Dig, a highway tunnel system under the city. The original estimate was $2.8 billion, began in 1991, and scheduled to complete in 1998. The final cost was $24 billion, completed in 2007, and with was 11 years late and 10 times over the projected cost. These bonds will be paid off in 2038. It is the most expensive U.S. highway project to date. So the costs are monumental. I would like to turn over that microphone now to former Deputy Mayor Raina Bologna. I'm hoping that at this point you realize that this project is moving forward. And if it's to be stopped, it will require a constant effort. Just look at how fast the governor is moving to see how serious this is. The project was first announced in January of 2016 with the initiation of the feasibility study. The feasibility study was published in 2000, December 2017. The request for statements of interest went out in January of 18 and were received April of 18. The environmental impact study is set to begin in September of this year and be completed by 2023 or sooner. So he's moving along with this. Construction of a tunnel, just so that you understand the process, would begin with the state seizing property through eminent domain, tearing down homes and businesses, and this would begin in approximately 2023, or maybe earlier, upon the completion of the environmental impact study. Construction would be completed, anticipated to be completed, by 2031. But that makes the erroneous assumption that there would be no legal and or engineering or construction challenges. That would, of course, force a number of delays, and we've seen through previous projects that that's almost a given. And once these delays begin, costs keep escalating. The governor's office has requested the step statements of interest and they asked for an analysis of the viability of the project in terms of overall mobility, economic growth, and the ability to generate revenue for construction, operation, and maintenance. They have received six proposals each proposal consisted of a consortium of three responses for a total of approximately 20 entities responding. All of the proposals, and this is pretty scary, affirmed that the project was practicable, feasible, and could be financed. Of course, they never told us how this would be financed, and we'd have to find that out. All of the responses were nearly identical, and each of them explained that the tunnel could in fact be built, and that it could be constructed and uh, ventilated. So I think you realize that this tunnel is no longer simply a proposal. It's moving forward and it's moving rapidly and it has to be stopped. So our next speaker is Jen Jones, she's a tech expert, and she's going to enumerate all of the extremely valid reasons for opposing this and what we're hoping you can do is listen carefully to what she says so that you can all use these arguments in your talking points with all of your friends and neighbors throughout the entire state. Thank you very much. Jen?
here. So yes, I think we mostly all agree that this must be stopped. So I'd like to walk you through some of the reasons why we all need to work together to oppose this tunnel. From concerns about our water supply, the impact on our environment and our communities, to ignoring our existing infrastructure needs, and spending $31 billion on a tunnel that we don't need and we don't want. So first, let's talk a little bit about the risk to our sole water supply. As many of you probably already know, Long Island gets all of its water from underground aquifers, mostly from the Magathy, which is the big one in the middle, but some of us, like those of us in Bayville, go all the way down to the Lloyd Aquifer. This image that you see up here is a cross-section of Long Island, looking from west to east, and you can see the bedrock underneath, which is where the tunnel would need to be laid. So drilling for a tunnel would have to bore through all of these layers, bringing a huge risk of disruption and contamination to the aquifers. Also, the proposed path would go straight underneath Center Island, which gets all of its water from private wells. So Center Island would need to find a new source of water. So I hope you all understand that any potential disruption to our fragile aquifers would be disastrous for all of Long Island because that would leave us with no access to clean water. So beyond just the water issue, another negative impact um, is to our environment. And this simply cannot be emphasized enough. Proponents of the tunnel would like us all to believe that by burying it underground, all of this exhaust magically disappears and is no longer an issue to be concerned with. But as you heard before from John, that's not the case. These giant ventilation towers will be sucking all of that exhaust through 18 miles of tunnel, congested traffic all day long, and putting it back into our air over Long Island. So while it will be concentrated wherever they place those exhaust towers, of course, air doesn't stay still. It would move all over the entire area, greatly reducing our air quality. Furthermore, the heat vibrations and sound, the, lo the loud noise of those uh, exhaust fans, cause major disruption to our fragile ecosystems. Think about the shellfish industry, the fragile water and ecosystem of Oyster Bay itself and Long Island Sound would all be disrupted by the, the air, noise, and heat pollution generated by those ventilation shafts. Another consideration is traffic. Proponents of the tunnel want us all to believe that the tunnel will relieve our traffic. Traffic is probably the one thing that New Yorkers complain about more than the weather. Everybody would like to get rid of traffic. So people, the one thing that we hear all the time when we go out and talk to people about the tunnel is when people are, think that they want the tunnel, it's because they think it will relieve traffic. But the fact is, it doesn't. The addition of a new, a new tunnel or new roadways just adds more congestion. Because what happens is it's not that the same number of cars spread out over more roads. More cars come out to drive. Traffic planners have known this for decades. It's a phenomenon called induced demand, that the more roadways you create, the more cars will come out and drive on them until traffic is just as congested as it was before you built the new roadways. And on that topic, I'd like to read you a quote for a minute um, from a biography that someone wrote on, uh, about Robert Moses called The Power Broker. Watching Moses open the Triborough Bridge to ease congestion on the, on the Queensboro Bridge, then open the Bronx Whitestone Bridge to ease congestion on the Triborough Bridge, and then watch traffic counts on all three bridges mount until all three were just as congested as one had been before. Planners could hardly avoid the conclusion that traffic generation was no longer a theory, but a proven fact. The more highways were built to alleviate congestion, the more automobiles would pour into them, and congest them and then for and thus force the building of more highways, which would generate more traffic and become congested in their turn in an ever widening spiral that contained the most awesome implications for the future of New York and of all urban areas. The same effect had been seen earlier with the new parkways that Moses had built on Long Island in the 30s and 40s, where every time a new parkway was built, it quickly became jammed with traffic, but the load on the old, old parkways was not significantly relieved. So if anybody ever tries to tell you that the tunnel would relieve our traffic problems, please believe that is not the case. Oh, sorry. In 
with all of these new roads and new drivers and new people, becomes, comes with it new development and new demands for high density housing. Because this kind of urbanization always follows the creation of new crossings. You have to remember that once Bayside, Queens was a quiet suburban town. Until, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but it's true. Until the construction of the White Stone and Frogs and Bridges resulted in it being overbuilt with high rise apartments. And since we're an island, we have no more room, we have no more land left for suburban sprawl. The only way to build is higher up and closer together. And it's not just cars we have to worry about. You heard a little bit earlier about these grand plans for industrializing the eastern end of Long Island. So it's trucks that we have to worry about as well. They are really one of the primary reasons why this tunnel is being proposed. To make it easier to bring freight um, to the eastern end of Long Island for industrialists who envision urbanizing Nassau County, the western end of Long Island, and industrializing the eastern end because of our convenient geographical location on the eastern seaboard. And as you've heard, this project is at a low end estimated to cost $31 billion. Meanwhile, we all know that there are pressing needs for existing infrastructure. Our roads, our bridges, our mass transit is crumbling around us and in desperate need of repair and maintenance. The New York State Department of Transportation estimates that it will take $67.7 billion to repair failing bridges and roads in New York. Over 17,000 bridges in New York alone need repair, and nearly 2,000 of those are classified as structurally deficient. We should be investing in fixing our current infrastructure. And it's not just our roads and bridges that are suffering, it's our mass transit system too. Long neglected New York City area mass transit really needs state financial assistance to maintain it and bring it into the, to a more modern era. The Long Island Railroad needs over $13 billion over the next 20 years for repairs and maintenance. It's estimated that $105 billion will be needed in the next 20 years to maintain and modernize our existing transit system. About $20 billion is estimated to be needed for the New York City subway system. The ventilation plants for 40% of our high priority subway tunnel segments do not meet industry standards. More than half of MTA bridges and tunnels are at least 70 years old. Our infrastructure is old, it's crumbling, and it needs investment. <laughs> Quite simply, as you've heard in detail already, this project makes zero financial sense. I don't understand how the result of that feasibility study found this to be what is it, financeable and uh, feasible, because the math does not add up in my head. The tunnel is projected to lose, as a best case scenario, a billion dollars a year without paying down its debt. And none of those estimates plan for cost overruns. They don't plan for additional construction, widening of, of surrounding roadways that would need to happen. They don't account for maintenance and repairs and daily operation. So when the tunnel authority goes bankrupt, which with that kind of math, it inevitably will, who's gonna foot the bill? Taxpayers of New York. Finally, this crossing is simply unnecessary. Um, we have existing crossings with the Frog's Neck Bridge and the Whitestone Bridge nearby, only three miles apart from each other. We have ferries to the east. Um, some people have asked, well, would this provide a viable evacuation route in case of an emergency? A couple things there. If there was an emergency, the last place I would want to be is in an 18-mile tunnel backed up in traffic. Just me. Um, but realistically, with the population size of Long Island, one additional tunnel would not have an impact and effectively evacuate people. You would need a series of bridges and tunnels spanning the entire North Shore back and forth to Connecticut to actually have a meaningful impact in case of a true emergency. So now I'd like to turn it back over to John Taylor for a bit. Okay, go back to what uh, our governor who proposed this 
project said originally. I think we can build a tunnel from one island to Westchester. Well, I think he's kind of disagreeing with himself because I call this the Battle of Como versus Como. In 2016, I think we can build a tunnel. In 2017, protecting our natural assets is critically important for Long Island. He goes, went on to say, it's critically important for Long Island by, and by restoring our shellfish populations and investing in the preservation of New York's coastal communities, we will strengthen the regional economy, create new jobs, and ensure our waters are clean. He disagreed with himself this year. Recently, he said offshore drilling would make our coastal communities vulnerable to the dangers of oil spills and other drilling disasters, drilling disasters, hmm. and jeopardize the health of our robust marine economy. New York will do everything in our power to prevent environmental disasters and will continue to safeguard our offshore assets and bolster our efforts to support renewable energy development. This is the same person who wants to drill and destroy all these ecosystems. Um, you need to contact him and tell him and remind him what he said back in 2016 when he wanted to propose this project and what he said since then and he said prior to that where he's always positioned himself as a champion of the environment. Um, he's also positioned himself as a champion of jobs. Well, as Jen pointed out, you know, we all understand that the unions are behind this because they want jobs. Well, luckily, we just got a jobs report that says we have the lowest unemployment, unemployment in the nation's history. And we have all these projects to do. The town of Worcester Bay has tons of roads to fix. Town, Suffolk County, Nassau County, bridges all over the state. I mean, if you lived in Buffalo, would you want to be paying taxes on a tunnel or a bridge you'll never use? So I encourage all of you to write to the governor, tell him what you've learned tonight, tell him why you're against it, and remind him of what he said about protecting the environment. And we've got a great thing going on here that we don't see in America lately. We've got bipartisan agreement on this issue. We have a lot of local people United behind. We have one of the mayors, a lot of them are here tonight, and a lot more met with us with Senator Marcelino. Um, they represent all the villages here. I'm sure if we reach out further with this presentation, we're going to get the mayors of almost every village on the whole of Long Island. Nassau County Legislator Josh, Josh Lafazan, Nassau County Legislator Delia DeRidgey Witten, Nassau County Legislator Hardy Drecker, who I just saw come in. Um, Westchester County Executive on the other side, George Latimer, and a lot of the people in office on the other side are opposed to this. As you know, our town of Westchester Bay Supervisor was one of the early people to come out and oppose this. Um, our Assemblyman from Bayville area and the large district, Mike Montesanto, Assemblymember Charles Levine, they're on, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, they're lockstep on the opposition to this project. As I said before, Senator Marcelino was one of the first to get on the bandwagon and say this is a bad idea. And Congressman Tom Swazi, um, when I called him and asked him where he stood, he said, well, the governor, that I ran against him once, so he doesn't really like me anyway, so I'm definitely against this. <laughs> but he's been very forceful, and he wished he could be here tonight to speak, but uh, he's definitely opposed to it. Another person who came out recently against it, and we've been reached out to her, is uh, somebody who's challenging the governor right now for the governor's trip. Cynthia Nixon, she came out recently opposed the tunnel proposal. She believes that we need to focus our resources on mass transit, and she doesn't think this is good for the environment. <laughs> Senator Flanagan, who's the temporary president and Things are changing in Albany, so we don't know how long he'll be president of the Senate, but he's opposed to it, and he's going to do everything he can to block it, but you need to call him and write to him anyway, and remind him that without his ability to put this tunnel authority in the works, the governor can't finance it. In other words, the legislature and we, Senator uh, Marcelino, Assemblyman Montesanto, and Assemblymember Levine have told me we will not support it. Uh, Chuck Levine went and talked to a lot of Long Island uh, 
assembly people. They said they're not going to support it. So there's a groundswell in the assembly to not support the financing of it and not support the creation of a tunnel authority. If this tunnel authority, and that's sort of like the MTA or the Thruway Authority or the Port Authority, they're an independent entity. They do what they want. Nobody oversees them. Uh, and you can see what happens with the tolls that have gone crazy in the Hudson River crossings, uh, that nobody's keeping an eye on them. Um, if that thing is formed, this thing could happen. So the idea of stopping this by making sure that your assembly people and your state senators don't approve and give the, the governor the ability to create this authority. They create it. The governor can't do it with an edict. They're the ones who create it. You've got to remind them, don't approve this. Don't let this tunnel authority be formed no matter what. Senator Flanagan is against it. How long he'll be in control, we don't know. But you've got to write to him, remind him, tell him you're opposed to it. Um, our county executive has not come out against this yet. Uh, we understand she's in a tough place now, so county's challenged financially, but we've put a lot of pressure on her, and we're going to continue to do it, and we want you to help us. Write to her, tell her she's got to stand up for the best interest of our area and oppose this project. And she'll listen, we hope. There's another organization that's recently been formed, and I'm going to turn this over now to Peter Janow, who is the executive director of the Coalition Against an Unsound Crossing. It's a private enterprise. Peter? Thank you, John. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, I usually get a good reception. Thank you very much, because often I'm the last person to speak, which means the brief is almost over. But we know the time spent so far tonight has been very informative, and we're all going to benefit from it. As John pointed out, I'm the Executive Director for Coalition Against an Unsound Crossing, and we're a new organization with a, a simple mission, and that is to stop any plan to build a crossing, whether that be a bridge or a tunnel, across Long Island Sound. And before we get more into the details about the organization, Public Speaking 101, dictates that until you get to know your audience. As a Long Island native my whole life, even though the bullet underneath my name, and I'll go to the next slide, shows that I served in the Marine Corps for about 20 years. I've been a Long Islander, New York resident my whole life. Never lost it, even when I was in Virginia, California, Florida, New York was my home. So let me ask you all a question. After 20 years of service, being all around the world, having a great time doing lots of fun stuff, why do you think I decided to come back and do the next phase of my life on Long Island. Do you think it was the good New York accent? Yeah, you think it was the taxes? You think it was the congestion on the roads? Do you think if we build a tunnel or a bridge, it's gonna improve any one of those? Absolutely not. So I'm here tonight as a fellow citizen, just like you, and I've been my whole life, uh, to work in solidarity with you and all these other civic groups to make sure this doesn't happen. Our board is comprised of a lot of business and uh, civic leaders. First, Heather Johnson, who serves as our president. She's the executive director also at Friends of the Bay, a wonderful organization. Bill Blyer, our vice president, you might recall him. He was a reporter with Newsday for how many years, John? Many years, 30 years? Originally back in the day. John Taylor, you all know this fine, uh, Good looking guy sitting to my left who serves as our secretary. And John, I will say you've been a wonderful source of uh, guidance for me as we've gone through this process. Lisa Ott, who's also president of the North Shore Land Alliance, knows a lot of the community and a lot of organizations that we're working with. Linda Henninger, she's almost like the John Taylor, but a little bit further east, president of the Kings Park Association. Matt May, Matt. Stand up and uh, wave to the crowd if you could. <laughs> President of the Youth Memorial Association, and was also the gentleman who helped introduce me to former Congressman Lester Wolf, as we point out, 99 years of age and tons of strength. We're probably going to need some of that. Eric Swenson is also with us here tonight. Eric was a former superintendent of environmental control with uh, the town of Oyster Bank. 
few other people, Mark Hopkinson, he went very light. I don't think he likes to plug himself. He is a very experienced, very intelligent individual who has been a wealth of perspective for all of us, and myself included. Larry Weiss, President and CEO of Atlantic Computer Group. Denise Evans Shepard, we all know Yogi Berra, right? Famous New Yorker, he made the statement, uh, deja vu all over again. And as we've pointed out, this bridge project or tunnel project, crossing project, is deja vu all over again. She's the director of the Oyster Bay Historical Society, so she's bringing a wealth of that recent history to fuel our fire and give us information to educate everyone and get the word out. And last but not least, Rob Ruska, who's a local attorney who's been providing good sound counsel in every step that we've taken so far. So, what we're doing in this new organization is to link everyone together. This isn't just an Oyster Bay issue or Bayville issue. This really isn't just even a Long Island issue. This is going to be a New York State issue. And there's lots of people that have concerned who want to get involved. And we felt the need for an organization to bring, to link everyone together for a consolidated effort to fight and defeat this proposal. We're going to do that through a lot of education and public outreach, like meetings we're having here tonight, um, plus a lot of other activities. And again, we're doing that through education, through facts, through figures, through hard numbers. We're also going to be engaged with a lot of politicians, and no offense, Mayor, to the elected officials in front of us. We all know sometimes elected officials need education too. So we're going to be sitting down with a lot of them, making sure they have all the information they need to make educated decisions. You'll see a bunch of advertising, TV, print, and on radio. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I have my first radio interview, which will be hopefully alive at some point. Um, and then also further engagement and coordination. Having said that, there is a sign-up sheet outside. Please sign that sheet. If you have any interest in being a volunteer and supporting our activities, sign that sheet and we'll be happy to work with you. Our website, because we're new, is not up and running yet, but please, in the next week, you will see it, www.unsoundcrossing.org. And if anyone had a question or request of me, you can reach me at that number, 516-508-9171. That's all I have tonight, but I look forward to working with all of you in the future and hope we're successful in our efforts. Thank you very much. Okay. That is about it. I think we just want to sum it up. What can you do? Get on your soapbox. You know, a lot of your neighbors on Long Island want a, this bridge. They want, they want this tunnel. They want it. You need to tell them what you heard learned tonight, why it's a bad idea. Talk to them face to face. Use social media. Uh, you got all those different vehicles you can reach out and talk to people about. Uh, tell them what you've learned. Tell them why. There's, uh, you know, there's 7 million people on the There's not a lot coming to these meetings. There's hundreds of us, but we need thousands. So you're all going to be evangelists to spread the word and convince people who like this idea to say, bad idea. People who want to get to Connecticut or Westchester quickly, not going to help you. To people who want jobs in the construction trade, tell them there's plenty of jobs to be had. We just need to give you jobs doing something else. Not this bad project. We all want you to have jobs. We're not fighting the unions. We're trying to help you, give you something productive to work for. Um, volunteer, as Peter said. We've got sign-up sheets. We have had two meetings so far, one in Bayville and one in Locust Valley. Joe, we have, what, about five, 600 people have signed up, and we're actively engaged in getting them to help create databases and write letters and make phone calls. And we'll probably have rallies and events, and you can carry protest signs when the governor gives a speech. Um, you know, it makes a difference. This is a cartoon from Newsday, just a few weeks ago. They got notice. You know, there's a pro there's us protesting the tunnel, and the guy on the right from Beth Page, he's worried about his water, and said, "What about me?" Well, we're worried about your water too. We're worried about our water, and we know what happened to Beth Page. They promised them. Nothing would happen, and you got the Beth Page plume where the water's contaminated. Do we really need to take that risk again? So it does matter that you came out tonight. It does matter that you talk to everybody you know and spread the word. And maybe your cartoon will be in your stage someday. So that's it. I want to call up some people who've asked to speak. Um, before I do that, I just want to mention that our last meeting, the gentleman who spoke, 
uh, came up and said, look, I'm a uh, New York City police officer, and I work by the Throgs Neck Bridge. And he said, you can't believe the amount of crime we have from the trucks. I said, what do you mean exactly crime? Well, you know, truck stops. These guys are driving all day and all night. A lot of them take a lot of drugs. There's a lot of prostitution. And with that brings the bad element, and the crime in those areas is through the roof when you've got trucks parked in truck stops. So imagine a big truck stop at the end of this tunnel right inside us and the implications of that. Something we hadn't thought about, but it came from the audience. So the first speaker we got tasked up was Christian Jan Jones. She's from Lattingtown, Christian. And there's a microphone at the end of the aisle here, if you could speak from there. If you can get through. that I'm interested in is talking about the wetlands, the federally protected, I thought federally protected wetlands. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. And if we went through this 10 years ago and we're going through it again now, is there anything we can put in place for the future for our kids that um, keeps us from having to go through this deja vu uh, every so often? You, you know, I'm going to let Peter speak to that. Um, do we have, have pass the microphone? Because all right, but there isn't my kind of tip. But um, he just had a meeting with the Department of the Interior, Fish and Wildlife, where he posed this uh, question. And I was just speaking to our Oyster Bay Commissioner of uh, Environmental Resources, Neil Bergen, who's here tonight. And he had the same opinion. He said, look, the state hasn't even asked permission to do this yet. And, and the people we know, Neil's got the deed in his pocket, probably, in the wetlands. He usually does. <laughs> And um, we have the deed right here, John. And he, Sal, uh, Supervisor Saladino has the deed right here. Yeah, may I just uh, yeah, please. address that, that question? Could you answer that? Would you can answer Very good question. What I'm holding is a copy of the deed between the town of Oyster Bay and the federal government. And in short, what this deed does in granting them the land under the bay to create the federal wildlife refuge. It states in this specifically, and this was from 1968, that if a tunnel or bridge is built under, over, on, or anywhere in the vicinity of this property, then the property would come back to the town of Oyster Bay, signed by the federal government and the town of Oyster Bay. So clearly our forefathers thought of this and, and uh, at the time, it was clear that there was no interest in building uh, of anything of this nature at the time, and the property will revert back to the town if they indeed built this. So this would be helpful in a lawsuit. I don't want to get too deeply into the, the legal aspects of it, but clearly this was addressed, and this is something that we are, are hanging our hat on. And we have talked about a number of ways in which construction of this type would damage our environment. And one thing that wasn't brought up, and I'm a over 13 mem 13 year member of the New York State Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee, acid rain is a big deal. We have quite a few lakes in New York State that are dead due to acid rain. Mostly there's issues of factories in, in uh, Canada and so forth where uh, a tremendous amount of carbon is uh, coming over the border, getting absorbed in the clouds, and comes down into the lakes and rains, it, through rain, where it has killed the wildlife in those lakes. So when we think about all that's done to protect our estuaries, it, it makes no sense. And on another note, because we get lots of calls on this issue, there are so many residents who want to build a simple bulkhead up here, access the water, and the state DEC says no. Well, if those simple uh, de minimis construction projects are destroying the land, how could you possibly let something this big be built in our town when you won't even let the people who own this town build a simple bulkhead and that's deemed to destroy our environment? So thank you for that question. George, George you had a comment too? Yeah, th there was uh, one other thing that, if you recall, going back several years, uh, the Nassau County executive wanted to expand West Shore Road, which is the road between Oyster Bay and Bayville. 
And the problem with that is that besides what the uh, supervisor pointed out, there's a reversion clause in the wetlands agreement that if the wetlands were infringed upon it, they would revert back to private ownership, which would then give the state the right to come in and use eminent domain to take the property. So it's, it, we've been walking a very thin tightrope since 1972, or 72, 73, when Rockefeller withdrew the plan. So anytime anybody wants to go in there and infringe upon those wetlands, you have to be extremely careful. So to answer your question, I think we've tried to cover it the best we can every single way, but that's no insurance that our children will have to put up with. Our next uh, question comes from uh, John Cinerella from Belmont Circle and Syosset. As a Syosset resident, I'm worried about what's going to happen to our property taxes now that the federal government won't let us write off the taxes. This is going to change our whole tax structure, I believe. He added the traffic and everything else, and I don't think it's going to help us at all. I think it's going to make us all end up with more taxes because we'll have to do more for the roads and more for everything else. People are going to end up being losers and not gaining anything. Thank you. I have a name I'm familiar with, an old friend, Bob Shorn from uh, Muttontown, New York. Bob, do you want to come up? Can you get to the microphone, Bob? Uh, thanks very much. I think my question actually had been answered. So I was aware that in uh, 1968, the Sold had a congressional bill passed that the uh, Oyster Bay Wildlife Refuge, which gave uh, a sanctuary and protection to uh, the wildlife in the area. Uh, where the bridge was going to be built uh, in 68. Uh, uh, my understanding was it was for in perpetuity, <laughs> forever, and now it's being challenged again. So other people have brought this, this question up myself, as I have, and I'm concerned that the, 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 the negative way, not concerned, I, I hope there's a way that we can enforce the law. Thank you. Well, this Supervisor Salavino said, and George reiterated, uh, we believe that is our. There are two real components that can help stop this, and one is the wildlife refuge that uh, Congressman Wolf helped her create, and uh, you know we, we feel pretty confident that that will be a major barrier. Um, however, you never know where the courts will go. Um, there have been other cases, as uh, um, Mr. Burden pointed out, where the uh, judges have ruled in favor of protecting the refuge, so we're very confident that will help. And the two pens that really will help stop this are the refuge and the lack and the barrier of not being able to create a tunnel authority. That's the, those are the two main hopes. And then, of course, public sentiment. I think that if enough people get their minds changed, this is a bad idea. And the governor sees his poll numbers slipping and Cynthia Nixon's going up, or whoever ultimately challenges from the Republican side, I think maybe he'll even change his mind. You know, one of the things that's probably driving uh, the governor is that his wish to be in the White House someday. And if he's seen as a master builder of infrastructure, that would be great. But if he's seen as being weak in his own state and being resisted by his constituents, that's not going to help him with the White House. And if he gets into a battle with environmentalists, that's not going to help with his own party. Um, the next statement um, oh, from our legislator, Josh Schlafasan. Thank you, John. Uh, two thank yous are in order. Number one, to the supervisor of this town board, credit is given where credit is due. You've been consistent, you've been indefatigable, and you've been loud. Thank you for your opposition. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. That's number one. We owe them a round of applause. Thank you. The second thank you is to Neil Bergen, who actually gave me a copy, showed me a copy of the deed. He's absolutely right, and I thank you, Neil. And the third thank you is to this anti tunnel committee. This is their third meeting. They've educated tonight over a thousand people so far in a little over two months. And that list of elected officials that came out in opposition was a lot shorter when they began than it is tonight. And that's because of all of you. 
So my ask here is simple. I'm 24 years old and I'm sick and tired of seeing my generation flee from this district. Building a tunnel through the heart of this district will make millennials flee faster than anything we can do. To retain them, we should invest money in our existing infrastructure, invest money in our downtowns, not invest money we don't have, mortgaging away a future of a generation that won't be here. So my ask is very simple. Go home tonight and tell three friends from outside this area what you learned. Because when people in Plain Edge, and when people in Massapequa, and when people in Mineola, and when people on the South Shore call the governor's office, who say, we stand for one Long Island, don't build this tunnel, when there's solidarity, then this thing won't happen. Because for a governor that's driven by public opinion, we need to push public opinion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Edward, good colleague from Syosset. Mr. Vitale.
it is also adjacent to another condominium called Eagle Rock. Between those two condominiums is a green light, right? Um, my condominium is at the very, very end, and I'm basically right in front of that green light. Eminent domain, I think we're all concerned about that, but has anybody looked at to see where 135 actually, where the big leap is going to start, and where 135 actually extends? Because underneath, after that extension, you've got the Long Island Railroad, which can go right underneath it. How does that affect everybody getting to work? Right? If you start digging these massive, you know, drill underneath the Long Island Railroad, it's not going to have an effect. And also have to look at the fact that at the end of 235, you also have PS 256, which is a school. They're going to dig underneath the school. They're going to tell all these kids because first go to other schools. I don't get this at all. I, I, help. I thank all of you guys for being here. But this makes no sense to me. If anybody can explain the impacts of one on the railroad the school. The, the actual engineering studies and planning has not been done. Um, this was a feasibility study that looked at all the issues that had to be addressed, and uh, they kind of took it and said, and, and we think they ignored a lot of the factors like the refuge, the wildlife refuge. They just basically never checked with the Department of the Interior. They just assumed that they could do it. Neil will tell you the opposite, that they can't do it. Um, but, um, you know, all the engineering has to be done. The next step of this process is they got the statements of interest from companies who want to do it. Now, in September, they're organizing and getting ready to do an environmental impact study, which should take two to five years. Part of the impact study is to develop preliminary plans of what will happen and what will happen to the environment if this goes through. At that stage, they'll begin the process of actually engineering it and drawing the actual lines and where it will drill and how deep and whatnot. And all those issues that you asked will be addressed then. They haven't been addressed yet. They haven't been addressed yet. Next speaker would be Richard Kalen from Hicksville. So most of the answers have been said tonight by some of you people. Thank you. Yes, we do have a traffic problem. That's what I'm worried about. And we can't handle the pollution anymore. That's we use this. It's getting worse than anyone can imagine. That's my concern. I don't like this project at all. I'm totally opposed to it. Make sure you tell everybody you know and tell them why. Uh, Mr. Schultz, Richard Schultz from Glen Cove. John Yan and George, uh, I remember you years ago in 1970 when the three proposals, and I live in Glen Cove, and one of the for the bridge at that time which was would have been a lot less expensive, probably one third of the cost. And I was, I was looking forward to that bridge. And also the other bridge that was suggested out of Little Floyd Parkway and Wade River to go over to Connecticut. But it seems like between Connecticut and uh, local politicians, everybody were against the bridge and finally defeated it. And Governor Rockefeller and Rose Moses at that time had all the connecting links and everything were in place, and it wasn't even built up. We didn't have the 1.3 million people in Nassau County and 1.3 million people in Suffolk. And you talk about the pollution, try to get over the Throgs Lake Bridge, the Whitestone Bridge, and across Bronx to try to get upstate. That's each and every day. And there's trucks lined up over the bridges, cars lined up over the bridges, and we have to suffer. And then what happens in New York, they're landlocked on this island. So I've always been, I've always been for a bridge over to Connecticut to get off this island. I mean, the ferry from Oregon Point is a three-hour ride across the Sound. Port Jefferson is also a couple hours across the Sound. And then the bridges, and it takes right now two to three hours just to get up into Rockland County. There's a connecting link is in Rye over there from Rye across Westchester into Rockland County. It, years ago, we used to make it up there an hour from all of Nassau County. Now it's about a three-hour ride to get upstate. And people forget about that. I and mean, yet there's that, that much pollution in New York and everything. And in, in Queens, I don't see the problems. I don't see all the, uh, like you brought up, your point you brought up about all the crime and everything that the brought up the bridge. I don't see it. Where's, where's it the crime? Uh, this was told to us by a New York City police officer. Yeah, right. Well, so if you don't think he knows what crime is like, then I don't know who does. I all over the city. If you want to look at all the different boroughs, look and listen to that channel 12 or and turn it off for all the negative news. But there's crime all over the whole city. So 
So I don't get angry with the truck is stopping on the side of the, the Clearview Expressway and a couple other places in Queens. It's causing all that kind of crime. I drive from here all the time, but I don't, I don't see it. Are you a police officer? No, but I'm, I'm a Do you know what they deal with? I'm a security guard, and I've been in the city. I was born in New York, mm -hmm. and I'm a New York City resident. I'm not okay. a resident now for the last 30 years. So I don't see the big problems that you, you could mention. As far as the, I, I'm surprised too, that this was brought up to go under, because you had that wet place along Shore Road. So I don't know how, how it's going to go under in Central Island, and that's all designated all wetlands over there anyway. So I don't know how this project would go at this point. It would make more sense to go out through Suffolk County with the wooden floor across to Connecticut. But then Connecticut's been opposed to this to the bridge tunnel for all these stuff for the last since 1970. That's 50 years. And now they're against it again. So I don't know how we're going to get to give up this island between you and me. But that's my but, personal opinion. But you see, that, that's the fallacy, the fallacy of the entire thing, is that to go, people might have an argument to go from Long Island to Connecticut, maybe. maybe. They do, they do. Maybe. They go upstate, they go to Boston, okay. they go but, out, they go to Jersey, and lately the traffic has gotten triple what it used to be. Okay, but to take, to take a bridge or a tunnel, from an area that currently isn't congested, that would be congested as we prove it. It wasn't congested back in 1970. You see the picture of the bridge you showed across the sound? No, the big, the I, big I problem understand. then was but people were opposed to the fact that they couldn't run their sailboats up and down Long Island Sound. Right, but right. the bridge was high enough but to clear the, the sailboat. But the point is that the, the new tunnel would generate the traffic, which would then lead to an area that's already congested. And that's the fallacy of this entire project. We have to we have a time limit. So we have a time limit, so I'd like to call up the next speaker. You raised your points. Thank you. And, and I will say to anybody else who thinks that, sorry, you're, thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you. I would say to anybody who also feels that, you know, they'd like a faster route off, and they don't value the suburban lifestyle that we treasure and the environment that we treasure, move closer to the tunnel. You can get to the project really quick if you're in one of those high rises on your bay side. Thank you. 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 Okay, we'll move to Ed Willey from Bayville. He left, okay. Doug Watson from Bayville, our former mayor. Thank you, and uh, you know that I'm opposed to this project from previous talks that we've had. Um, those of you who know me from Bayville, we're in a, a different environment here tonight. Uh, know my you know, my same old one to play about the condemnation we faced in the 1980s in Queens when they wanted to build the Dome Stadium to replace the Jets when they left. And we faced condemnation. We faced the same thing. We had a committee and we met. After we worked all day, we would meet. And then we had to go in. One day we protested in front of Trump Tower. It was for the Trump generals at the time. As I've told you guys all that stuff. Yeah. Um, the one theme that always went through my head through the three years that we fought this is, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to go through all this nonsense? Because Andrew Cuomo's father at the time wanted to take our property, build a stadium, because they let the Jets slip away. One guy gets a dream to build a tunnel, and then all the people's livelihoods and houses and, and Lives are disrupted, and possibly by having it actually happen. I don't think it will ever happen, but we must be vigilant. Why do we have to go through this? I, I just don't, you know, so we can't, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody's going to be able to answer it. But it's not fair that people have to come out. It's very nice. Everyone's here tonight. That's very nice. But we could be home, and we could be relaxing. But we have to go through this, and this might take years. This might seriously take some years to, to get this to be dead. We killed that stadium project. And the, the New York State Urban Development Corporation had to hold a press conference and announce on television 
that it was dead. And that was, we never thought they would do that, but we made that happen. So let's keep up the good fight. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, it's your point of the officer, the one serve or a profession, but it's a real good question. Why do we have to do it? Because people in government don't learn the lessons of the past. And they keep putting this stuff up and we just have to keep fighting it. But that's why we're all here tonight, because we don't, you know, most of us, we heard one dissenting voice, but most of us realize that this is going to destroy our urban lifestyle, our suburban lifestyle. One of the problems with this project is that, you know, when we resist it from the North Shore, it's seen as NIMBY. NIMBY is an acronym for Not In My Backyard. This is really about not in my backyard for all Long Islanders because it's going to change the nature of Long Island. It's going to turn the Suffolk farmland into factories and warehouses. It's going to industrialize the, the island. It's going to turn Long Island into Queens. A lot of people left Queens because they didn't want to live in the congested area with higher crime rates. And no matter what anybody says, you look at the crime rates, they're higher in New York City and in Queens than they are on Long Island. We've had almost no crime in Bayville, and I'm sure there's other communities that have none. We don't want it. We don't want that kind of change. We live here for this lifestyle. This tunnel could change that. So that's part of the, the answer, and Doug, I know you lived it as our mayor. So the next question would be uh, from Dina, uh, excuse me, the pronunciation, Hominsky from Oyster Bay. Just say thank you for uh, having this here. Uh, I wasn't able to get to Lotus County or Bayville. Uh, I'm going to give you a little history. Actually, I'm uh, of Italian American descent, and it was my grandfather back in 1938 when this actually came up then, and back in 1962, who actually fought. And he came from the south shore of Long Island in Freeport. And he fought it basically because at those times he felt that we didn't need a bridge. We had a bridge in the city, we didn't need one here. And we didn't need to destroy our environment. Back in 1965, I remember him telling me as a 10 year old kid, so I'll give you my age, um, and that moved out of Nassau County because it's getting too crowded. He moved to Wading River, and when he heard that they wanted to try to build a tunnel then, uh, out by Wading River at William Floyd, he fought that. And I think now we need to really think about our environment. No one has asked the question, what will happen to the oyster industry with uh, which is a, a multi-million dollar industry, what will happen to that? I mean, I don't think oysters <laughs> really like a lot of vibration or uh, problems. It's, I don't know if anyone's here from flowers or can answer that question. They are not, but we have spoken to them and we've spoken to the Bayman, and they are obviously opposed to the Bayman. Uh, were present at the previous press conferences hosted by uh, Senator Marcelino and by Supervisor Saladino. They were there in force. Um, and they're obviously uh, naturally opposed to this. Anything that put risk at risk, there's a big battle over the dredging between the Bayman and the Flowers uh, organization. Um, but they're all united in this, that this would not be a good thing for the Bay. One of the omissions from the feasibility study, which was significant, were the environmental concerns. And all they did is address them on a very cursory level, but didn't answer one concern. Yet they had a conclusion to say it was feasible without any conclusions regarding environmental impact. One of our focuses is going to be, whatever the process is and whoever's involved, demanding that they pay attention to those environmental issues and give concrete, specific answers. We think we know what the conclusions will be and what the results will be, but they need to be public and they need to be transparent because they likely will not be good. So thank you, man, for bringing that up. Thank you. We only have a few more speakers left, but um, 
The next one would be Jack Ostrich, I believe, from the, he's the president of the Huntingville Civic Association in Woodbury. Is that the right name, Mr. Sir? Ostrich. Um, thank you for doing this tonight. Um, you got my sort of a dual track for us. One is the political uh, lobbying track, and the other is potentially a, a legal challenge that we see for a little while. My question is, is the power of state legislature absolute in the sense of creating an authority, or is there a process or a legal argument that we can take these state uh, legislatures around the, the development of this authority? In other words, have we gone down the road of um, identifying whether or not there are uh, potential, let's say loopholes, but loopholes to avoid uh, the state from actually even considering this for legal or or I think that the best person to answer that is somebody who spent a long time in the State Assembly, Supervisor Saladino. Well, thank you for that. Uh, when the state legislature takes a vote to create this, that's that. But then, obviously, a legal challenge to that would put this uh, um, a suit like that in court probably for quite some time. In other words, they may have the, there may be some challenge down the road, but the, the right to create the... From a practical standpoint, once the state has voted on this, it would be very difficult and expensive is the other issue to challenge this successfully. Okay, so environmental impact study and then both. Environmental impact study is very important. We're continuing to push from our end of the town. And I, I will add something to you. You made that compliment of having spent quite some time in the New York State Assembly. Uh, there is someone here who has spent longer than I and he should be uh, recognized and thanked. I was saving the best for last. And that is former assemblyman, former supervisor of the town of Oyster Bay, Lou Yaboli. I said, I said it to you all come in, and um, I was saving the best for last. So you'll hear from him soon. Uh, the next person is Dr. Susan, Suzanne Sepperson from Locust Valley. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I lived in Locust Valley for over 40 years, and I've written about the bridge and was a post to it for 40 years, and the Times and the Newsday, and I've written about Robert Moses, so I feel very solid in my opposition. But I have two points. One, nobody mentioned the health impact. Everybody's all concerned about breast cancer on Long Island. Well, what about you know, or lung cancer and all the other potential cancers that could occur from this? So I think that has to be part of the environmental statement. The other thing is that I'll tell you, just in terms of my background, I'm a, uh, I'm a former chair of the sociology department at Dowling College, and uh, I'm very aware of politics and strategy. And I really didn't hear so far a coherent strategy. I understand, it sounds very, I understand you have to mobile up book opinion, but the bottom line is you have to count heads, and you have to know the process by which the authority would be created. And this is a nice thing, is I think it's very bipartisan, but I think that's where the energy has to be spent. In who is voting, who gets to vote, how many votes do you need, how many votes can we count on, elections are coming, who should we support that will side with us in terms of our own stance. That's where our energy has to be focused, because rule number one is politician, everybody else wants to keep their job. So if, in fact, we know who's on which side, then we'll know where to mobilize. So that would be the first step. In the slide that Mr. Janow discussed, that was in there. He may have brushed through it quickly, but the Coalition Against an Unsound Tunnel is going to be the active agency doing the lobbying. They're going to be counting heads and taking names, and that's part of what they do. This process has a strategy. It is educate, which is why we're here tonight. It is to motivate, and it is to reach out and spread the word. We're evangelists, so to speak. We know that we're uh, maybe five, six hundred thousand. Uh, Supervisor, how many are in the population of the town of Whiskey Bay? We are just below 300,000 okay. residents, and I hope that all 300,000 of our residents will go to sign on to our online petition. You spoke to numbers, and they're playing such an important role from a, a sociology standpoint.
To find this site, go to oysterbaytown.com slash no bridge here. There's no spaces, very simple. Oysterbaytown.com slash no bridge here. And make sure your neighbors, your friends, everyone has gone to that site because numbers do count. And in addition to that, I bring this up because of your, your uh, mentioning the issue of counting heads in terms of our elected officials, in terms of uh, political people. And I only bring this up because you did show uh, Cynthia Nixon on one of the slides. I reached out to County Executive Mark Molinaro, who will be running head to head with Governor Cuomo this coming November. And Mark Molinaro is entirely opposed to the bridge. I will also point out that we are joined by Andrew Monteleone, who is running for State Assembly, who is also entirely opposed to the bridge. And while we're mentioning names, it's only fair to mention to the fact that Congressman Tom Swazi, who couldn't be with us because he's in session as well, sent a representative to join with us this evening. And I'll say this again, one word, oysterbaytown.com slash no bridge here. Okay, and I just want to add to that. I think we have to get the Westchester people involved with the Justice Opposed today. We, we, we are. I was interviewed on um, Westchester Television last week. We uh, reached out and we I was actually got an email right before the meeting from somebody who's running for the Lieutenant Governor uh, spot and is a resident of Rye who wants to join in the fight. And we've been in touch with a lot of the work people over there. They have not been as engaged as the folks on Long Island, but uh, as I showed on the slide, Westchester County Executive George Latimer is against it. Uh, Assemblyman Levine and Assemblyman Santa talked to a lot of their fellow legislator, uh, assembly people, and they've gotten a, almost a unanimous response from everyone on Long Island that they're opposed to it. And they're going to continue that fight with the upstate people because. You know, if you're an assembly person from Oswego County and none of your constituents are ever going to go near this bridge or this tunnel, why would you want it to be a liability on your taxes? They wouldn't. So the strategy is education, outreach, engagement, and then we're going to be using the volunteers to write and help us contact the constituents and the representatives in every county in every legislative district throughout the state. So we do have a strategy. You may not have seen it all laid out here tonight, but it's in a, it's engaged, it's in action, and this is part of it why you're here tonight. Uh, Stephen Burton. Did you want to like? There are petitions online, uh, but again, if you want to speak, you'd have to come up. I have a few more speakers, but there have been many petitions circulated. Petitions are great, they get people engaged, but I think that uh, what we're doing here tonight, what we're asking you to do, to talk to your friends and family throughout the state and Long Island, and tell them why, you know, if you ask somebody who's a relative in uh, Islip, they may think it's a great idea. Tell them why it's not. That's what we need to do. As I was starting to say, I asked the supervisor how many people, he said 300,000 in Oyster Bay. Well, we've got a lot of the mayors and officials from Suffolk County to join us. They were Senator Marcelino's district. They were at those press conferences. They were at those planning meetings. Um, they've got people outside the district from the uh, Legislature Delia to Richie Witness district to the west, east to the west of us who are engaged. So if we count Oyster Bay and those other districts, we might have a half a million people. Let's say we got 700,000 people. The population of Long Island is 7 million. We're outnumbered 10 to 1 at best. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to convince everybody else why this is a bad idea. Now, you know, they'll say, well, um, one of the things we heard is, well, you know, you could have said that about the Throgsnick Bridge. We didn't need it. You know, you could say that about any it helped. It relieved congestion for a while on the Whitestone. But believe me, most of the time they were both pretty bad. At some point you have to say stop. Because if you keep building it, you keep moving New York City east, and that's exactly what these companies want. They want high density population, lots of workers, lots of people to staff these warehouses and factories, and you end up with all of Long Island 
the suburban life being destroyed, and it turned into an urban area with all the negatives. If you want to live in the city, that's great. The city's wonderful. Move to the city. Don't destroy the suburban lifestyle just because you want to save a half an hour or an hour on your travel time. Sometimes it has to stop. The development has to stop. You have to say enough. Uh, Stephen Rubinson from Woodbury. In the meanwhile, I just want to point out we're also joined by Judge Paul Mealy. Paul, Judge, thank you for joining us. I know you're also in opposition. Thank you. So, uh, Stephen Rubinson, not here now. Okay, and then we'll have uh, Skip Doman from Glenhead. First of all, I just want to say I live in Glenhead, and uh, I lived on Long Island for about 40 years. I moved here from the Midwest, and Long Island is just a fabulous place. So, um, one thing I just want to mention: the reason why I moved here was that I was actually a, a medical rep for 26 years, and covered most of the metro New York area. And I can say that some of the hospitals that I called on were in Bronx. Across the Bronx Expressway, what is most of the traffic? Trucks, right? right? The Bronx is known in the hospital when I went in, it was known as Asthma Alley. Something like that, they order 50% of the trucks <coughs> asthma in the Bronx. Do we need that on Long Island? I don't think so. But um, I say that I'm, I'm retired now, but I actually do volunteer work for a wildlife organization in Locust Valley. The wildlife are really <coughs> speaking for those who don't know about what it's wildlife, and uh, the wildlife here is just fantastic. And uh, if something like this happens, it's going to be great. And it's not just Long Island. This is home for uh, you know all the migratory species. On the, on the East Coast, so it has to stop. The development has to stop. This has to stop. Thank you. And last but not least, our former town of Worcester Bay supervisor and assemblyman, state assemblyman, who was back here working with George and Bill Blyer and others back in the days of the bridge fight in the seventies. Lou Uvelli. I know it's late in the evening and I appreciate the patience that you've all shown. You've heard it all from a lot tonight, but let me just say one thing. We are extremely fortunate in this battle. We owe the people who represent the residents of Bayville a debt of gratitude. Had they not brought this to the forefront and informed of, of us of what was going on, we wouldn't be here this evening. Pleased that the town of Oyster Bay has done an incredible job. They're united. They are opposed to this. This is not a partisan issue. It was not a partisan, partisan issue back in the 1960s when we defeated Robert Moses' proposal and Governor Rockefeller ultimately withdrew it. I don't want to be redundant. You've heard an awful lot tonight, and there are things that and somehow become very difficult to understand. Let me just say one thing. The aquifers. Jen pointed it out. She is absolutely accurate. I was fortunate in the mid-80s to pass a law that's known as sole source aquifer law. It exists in New York State. It became a model of legislation for other states. What does it mean? It means all the water that we drink, that we cook with, and we bathe in, comes from an underground source, our aquifers. The upper layer has been contaminated since the 1920s. Most of it now comes from the back of the aquifer. Under that is the Lloyd Aquifer. That's the last pristine source of water that we have. If, for any reason, contamination exists in those areas, and what happened to the upper glacial aquifer would have happened here, you have to understand something. It's our only source of water. It is irreplaceable. If it's contaminated and we can't use it, that's it. You're going to have to import water from other areas. 
is the only way we could possibly survive. And, and that really escapes me when they come up with these incredible proposals that make absolutely no sense if you understand the situation. The financing, a complete disaster. There is no way that you're going to bring this project in at $50 billion. Billion, not million. That's a figure that is very difficult for the human brain to comprehend. $50 billion, the budget for the entire county of Nassau is $3 billion. Think about what I just said. Now you've got a $50 billion debt to build a tunnel and a bridge, or however they're going to do this thing, possibly with a rail line. And I'm telling you right now, there's no doubt in my mind that should they ever be able to do this, it'll be close to seven, eight hundred billion dollars. It is an unsustainable debt. The state cannot afford that kind of a debt. We're the ones who bear the brunt of it, we're taxpayers. And it's very easy to say, well, we're going to finance it this way, we're going to do that. If this were ever brought to the stock market, they wouldn't get one investor who would put 10 cents into this project. Because they know you cannot sustain this debt. You're going to have to have 100 year bond issues, which I've never heard of. In all my years in the legislation, all my years as an elected official, never heard of a 100 year bond issue. That's the minimum bond issue you'd have to have here. And they admit. They admit that there's going to be a deficit every year of maybe a billion dollars. Now think about the logic of that. It makes absolutely no sense. You're going to build this thing, and you're still going to have a debt every year mounting of over a billion dollars. Let me tell you something one other thing, because it's difficult to understand the authorities, okay? I never liked authorities. I don't like them because I was a legislator. I was an elected official. I was responsible to the people who put me in office. You create an authority, they're responsible to no one. And I love some of the individuals who are in office once they've created the authority and things don't go right and fares are increased or tolls are increased, they say, we're going to fight that. No, you had the opportunity in the very beginning not to create the authority. You gave up your own authority at that point. After the fact, it's too late. So someone made the point that the key to this whole thing for starters is to prevent, prevent the creation of the authority. We don't have one authority in the state of New York that is remotely considered a success. It's a hell of a track record when you think about it. So all I can say is simply this. We owe the individuals up on the stage a debt of gratitude. We owe everybody who attends these meetings a debt of gratitude. And if you're for it, that's your prerogative. I, I said at the last meeting when I spoke, I had dinner with a couple from Suffolk County. They thought this was a wonderful idea. Oh, we're going to get to New England faster. Now, you're not going to get to New England faster. The terminus of the Throgs Neck Bridge, from there to what they're proposing, seven mile difference. If you start to add the math and say to yourself, how much a mile are we going to pay for this great access? It's ridiculous. Bad proposal. Got to stay united. We did it in the 60s. And there is no doubt in my mind we're going to do it again. We're going to do it because we're going to have all of the incorporated village mayors on our side. We're going to have everyone we possibly can get, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Conservative, on our side. And you know what? When they begin to see these numbers and they realize that we are completely united, it's not going to be a cakewalk for them. Right now you've got bureaucrats who are looking at plans and they have no idea what Long Island is, or what we're about, or what our problems are. It would seem to me that someone with some common sense would say, you know what? You can invest in something like high-speed ferries. You have to subsidize it. You can run one million for the cost of this. And you have great access to the women. It would be unencumbered. It would be environmentally sound. And it wouldn't cost you a fortune. If this goes through, I'm telling you now, the future of New York State is in peril. Because frankly, you cannot, cannot retire this debt. The future of Long Island is also in peril. Because when you start drilling and you go through under the sound, there is no way you can avoid impacting on the aquifers. And as I said before, you do not contaminate them, that's the end of our source of water. We don't have mountains. We don't have an abundance of freshwater streams as they do in most areas of the state. This is it for us. 
So again, it's ridiculous that they're fighting this battle all over again, but we have no choice. You tell the elected officials who will for it that we're not going to forget this on election day. Stay in our country. Supervisor decided to save money on lifeguards by making it 51 degrees this morning. <laughs> but we do hope you have a great summer. We hope you stay engaged. And uh, when you think about going to the beach, just remember if this tunnel existed, you think our beaches are crowded now? Well, there's a lot of invaders up north who'd like to get a quick access to our beaches. So, you know, we've got a moat called Long Island Sound that kind of, they want to put a drawbridge down with everybody through. I want to thank the people who worked with me on the committee, um, and we continue to do it. I want to thank our outgoing mayor, Paul Ruck, because without Mayor Ruck realizing that we needed to be proactive and asking us to work on this committee, and we put in a lot of hours, this wouldn't have happened. So when, when Lou Yavori said thank us, it starts with our mayor. So thank you, Paul. And I want to thank the town of Bishop Bay and Supervisor Salvino and the council people for inviting us here tonight. And uh, I'll thank you again for coming. Thank you, John Hunter, for John Taylor, and the Andrew Connell Committee. Thank you for your efforts and very much for the host. On behalf of James Stefanich, Louis Brodo, Joe Muscarella, Tom Hand, and someone who continues to be our shield and our sword on the North Shore, Councilwoman Michelle Johnson and myself. We will stay united and we will fight this tunnel and with your support, we will win.